My name is Caitlin. I'm the program director here at the Stearns History Museum. And today, on the things we did for fashion, we are going to talk about the very long history of the corset. To people living in the year 2023, the idea of wearing a corset is not a very appealing one. I, for one, like to go about my day being able to breathe unconstricted. Um, but as we all know, the rules of fashion have not always been so relaxed. The history of the corset is a long one, so long that it would be impossible to cover it all here. But allow me to hit some high points. Though there exists evidence of corsetry, or at least pieces of clothing resembling corsets, that date back as far as 1600 BC, the regular wearing of corsets in European society began in the 16th century. During the Middle Ages, loose-fitting clothing was the norm for women, as the body, meaning of course the woman's body, was viewed as sinful. You can see evidence of that in this 12th century cartoon of a demon wearing, indeed, a corset. But in the 15th century, in France, the beacon of the fashion world then, as it is now, women at court began regularly wearing a garment called a cot, which when translated means on the rib. It is much like a corset, though it had a square neckline, leaving women somewhat exposed. But that was the whole point. Just ask Agnes Sorel. After the cot's popularity in France, the corset went mainstream. This was helped along by Catherine de' Medici, who was Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, who went so far as to ban thick waists at court making corsets basically essential. However, I should point out, modern historians believe this may have been a myth, but it's a fun story, so let's go with it. During the 17th century, most corsets were made of whalebone or reed, and it's important to keep in mind that it wasn't as much about making the waist disappear as it was about support and creating a sort of crisp and streamlined look with the fabric laying directly on top of that structure to achieve the desired silhouette. Before we jump into the 19th century, a period where corsets were perhaps at the height of their popularity in Europe, I would like to point out that it was not only women who wore them. Men found themselves following the strict rules of fashion as well, and those slim trousers and form-fitting jackets were not the most forgiving. Accentuation of the chest and shoulders was the goal, and sometimes a high cost was paid to achieve it. Now, when a lot of people think about corsets, they jump immediately to many of the misconceptions that surround them. Women couldn't breathe, women laced their corsets so tight that it damaged their organs, women fainted on fainting couches, even the old chestnut where the woman would have a rib removed in order to lace that corset even tighter and achieve an even smaller waist. I used to have a waist just like Scarlett O'Hara. Well, you know that girl had an 18-inch waistline. Blanche, that girl and her waistline were fiction. First of all, tight lacing was definitely a trend, one that began to show up in the mid-19th century, around 1840. Tight lacing, to be clear, is the practice of tying the corset laces extremely tight so as to achieve an almost obscenely tiny waist. But it is important to remember that corsetry and tight lacing are two different things. Corsets were largely used for support. Tight lacing just took the idea of a corset to new extremes. The introduction of metal eyelets to the corset, something that happened in France in 1828, made this trend possible. Did women have trouble breathing while wearing a corset? Usually, no. However, if they did fall victim to the tight lacing trend, then yes, it certainly happened. Contrary to popular myth and legend, a 16 or 18 inch waist is not any way to live. And it's important to remember that corsets were working garments that were meant to morph to the shape of the women wearing them. Did the corset do damage to women's internal organs? Honestly, yes. There is concrete evidence of this. Shifting, contorting organs, misshapen livers, deformed ribs, indigestion and constipation, and eventually weakened back muscles. But overall, the horror stories are greatly exaggerated. 
Now, about the fainting couches. Were they present in women's rooms just to catch them when they fainted from their corsets being laced too tight? They were there, sure, but they had nothing to do with women passing out. In fact, the term fainting couch is a modern term. During the 19th century, these were referred to as daybeds. Once the maids or housekeepers made the bed for the day, it stayed made until bedtime, which meant that if they needed some alone time in their room, like a siesta, or just wanted to lie down and read or relax, the daybed was the place to do it. And finally, did women remove ribs to tie their corsets even tighter and have even tinier waists? No, just no. Elective cosmetic surgery in the 19th century, especially in the general vicinity of the stomach and all those other vital organs, was not a thing. The end. In the 19th century, the corset style that dominated was what we think of as the hourglass shape. But at the beginning of the 20th century, a new shape emerged, at least for a time. This was called the S-Bend shape. These were also, for some reason, referred to as health corsets. The belief was that, because it placed less direct pressure on the abdomen, it was therefore healthier, while also encouraging a more proud posture. But the trend was short-lived, and was also found to exacerbate the sway-back posture. With the First World War, styles began to loosen, quite literally. A lack of materials meant less clothing and less constricting fashions. And the flapper silhouette eliminated the hourglass almost entirely. But even today, some 100 years later, corsets pop up here and there. But thankfully for all of us, we can go about our daily lives without lacing up. Thank you everyone for checking out the video, and we hope to see you around the museum sometime. See you later.